So good evening. Yep. Okay. So thanks for this opportunity. I think uh, maybe you can start by introducing yourself and a bit about you to our audience. Who are you? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, maybe you can get started with you know the context of the video, and then uh, once I'm done. But yeah, hey guys, uh, my name is uh, Pushkar Patak. I'm the yeah. owner and creator of Watt Wagons. We are a, a boutique uh, electric uh, mobility electric bike company based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm really glad to uh, share with you today uh, our story and you know what makes us special. And uh, of course, we get to answer some cool questions, Gad, that you might have. Okay, that's nice. Very brief and very punchy. Okay, so I think we, we, first of all, we'd like to know a bit about you personally. Who is Pushka and how did you get into this whole mobility space? Yeah, so th th that's a great question. So we, um, I've been, you know, uh, the, the, the electric mobility thing uh, didn't really happen all of a sudden. It was, it was in stages. So almost 10, 12 years ago, as we were, uh, as me and my family were looking at, you know, purchasing my next car, uh, we were actively looking at, uh, you know, getting getting off of, uh, you know, your traditional uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. So we started, you know, buy and, and bought a a hybrid vehicle, which is part battery, part okay. uh, uh, petrol. But uh, over the past five to six years, uh, I started commuting to my work uh, uh, on a on a bicycle you know just to be just to get back in shape uh, also minimize my overall footprint my carbon footprint and as i biked a little bit more i, I realized that i'm a terrible biker by the way i'm like horrible okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's interesting so, so, so like, you know what <laughs> So the, the biking was uh, mainly for environmental reasons and pretty fit. Yeah. So, uh, but but uh, as I bike, you know, my, my average speed is about eight kilom eight miles per hour, or like around twelve kilometers an hour, give or take, twelve thirteen kilometers an hour. And then I would see people just zipping past me left and right, and I was like, man, this is okay. terrible. I need to go a little bit faster. So, <laughs> so I started searching for some sort of an assist and. Um, then I found, you know, a set of kits that had just started to come out in the market. And you could, you could take the bicycle wheel, you could put like a motor on it, you could put a battery, and then every time you pedal, it would assist you and allow you to go a little bit faster. So I started experimenting with those, and I realized that that significantly increased the amount of fun I would have on my bike. So I, I biked a lot more uh, because I had that level of assist with me. I could go a little bit faster. Uh, so I would never, I wouldn't feel as super tired, uh, but I would still get a bunch of exercise out of it. So it started more around that than anything else. But the longer I biked, I realized that uh, things were breaking all the time, right? I mean, the more you ride vehicles, especially bicycles that are not meant to be electric vehicles, they tend to break in un unanticipated ways. So as an example, uh, you know, the chains would run out a lot faster because there's a lot more pressure in them. The wheels would go out of true because now you're, you're riding a lot more of them. So you need better quality wheels. Okay. You're, uh, you're sitting down a lot more on your saddle. So you need a more comfortable saddle. Okay. Uh, um, if you're going in the rain, you know, you don't want your battery to be exposed to the rain. So you needed some waterproof covering on the battery, right? So it's little things, I mean, your hands, you wanted to make sure as you were riding, you wanted the hands to be uh, not vibrating all the time, right, as a cycle moves. So you needed better grips uh, and so on and so forth. So it's just like one problem after another that I tried to solve and that at some point I'd solved enough problems. So if, if I can make a good analogy, have you seen the movie, The Martian? Yeah, the Martian yeah, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like that, so you know, this the guy, guy is stuck Maroon on Mars. On Mars. Mars, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he solve, yeah, I know. So he has to solve enough problems to get back to Earth, right? So for me, getting back to Earth was like coming up with a with a 
vehicle that needed minimal maintenance because not only am I a terrible biker, I'm also really lazy. I don't want to maintain things. Okay, I just want stuff to work. <laughs> okay, but, but, but how far was your workplace from? Right, so, so typically, home? yeah, so average distance is around 18 kilometers uh, one way. One so way. around 30. So 36 one way. kilometers. Okay. Yeah. So I, that's I, I'm, I'm asking that because I, I, was, I was thinking about here in Africa for the population that bikes. I use bicycles. We're well, not talking about motorbikes, yeah. we're talking about bicycles, right? Yeah, yeah, bicycles, okay. absolutely. Good, good, okay. good. And, uh, and the big, the big thing there is, uh, that's really, if you look at, um, uh, if you want to do casual biking, so not related to business, but if you want to do biking just for your own self, that appears to be a good, you know, between 18 to, you know, the upper bound would be around 24 kilometers is where you feel really good bicycling to if you had some level of assist. You can get there within an hour, hour, 10 minutes, hour, 15 minutes, right, on the upper side. But the same distance, if you were to cover on a non-electric bicycle uh, at, you know, 12 kilometers an hour average speed or even slower sometimes, that takes you two to three hours, right? Okay. So, so you, you're really saving a lot of time by switching to some sort of assist. And with that assist, now you have to solve a, this is a completely different set of problems, right? Because your battery capacity um, only allows you to go so far, right? I mean, if you, if you drive, if you, if you ride on, on the batteries that we have, and I'll share my screen in a second just to show you the types of bicycles we build. You can go up to uh, 60 kilometers to 70 kilometers on a single charge of the battery. Okay? So that was a big, big thing personally for me because I didn't want to go to the office, charge my battery because there was no, no charger where I, where I would park the bike. So I wanted enough charge left on the battery so I could come back home, right? So, so it's, it's like the So you the just want to that, charge one, one way. You charge at home, way. then you go and you come exactly. back. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so, uh, yeah. I, was, I was going to ask, um, before we, we continue, your background professionally, do you have, it's like, uh, are you an engineer? Yeah. So, so my undergrad is, it, uh, is uh, in engineering, in chemical engineering, believe it or not. Chemical engineering, uh, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, from the, yeah, from the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. And okay. then my first master's is, uh, is in information systems from okay. Carnegie Mellon University okay. in Pittsburgh. And my second master's, believe it or not, is <laughs> in investment management from Boston University. Okay, so uh, I, mean, I, was, I was just wondering <laughs> uh, whether maybe if there's some sustainability, electric or <laughs> storage. I mean, I do get the chemical aspects, so I mean, there's a, a link there. Yeah, yeah, and, and really uh, the sustainability piece, uh, sustainability is, at least for me, is a very loaded word, right? Sustainability can mean a lot of things. Okay. It is a lot of problems shortened into one word. Sustainability sometimes can mean uh, the ability to minimize your, you know, minimize your carbon footprint, okay? Sustainability means that whatever output you have or wastes you have can be recycled, right? That could also mean sustainability. Uh, sustainability can mean that you can continue your level of progress over a period of time with minimal amount of disruption to the rest of the society, right? So sustainability is a very, is not a well-defined problem. And my background is kind of suited for something like that because I have exposure to different aspects of things that can go wrong, right? So whether it is on the engineering side, uh, understanding, uh, what your footprint is or, or having the, the background to calculate what your footprint might be, uh, the financial background to, to calculate what the financial outlay is to fix that particular problem. And then a software background to understand, okay, how can we automate some of these things that we are running into, right? So, so I think 
uh, even though <clears throat> there isn't really a one single, you know, no degree in environmental science, uh, it really provides me, and I'm happy that my background provides me with the right tools to approach sustainability with, with a different flavor, if you will. Okay. So, so, so when did uh, you move from seeing this whole biking thing as a way to exercise and <laughs> before we even go there, I, yeah. was, I was going to ask, so before you started biking, I'm assuming you used to drive or take some form yeah. of transport. Yeah. Okay. To work. How long yeah. did you, was, was it taking you to go? Were you driving? So, yeah, yeah. So, so driving with traffic, uh, uh, so I live in the Boston area. So anywhere you drive in traffic, it's going to take you one hour, right? So okay. if it's, uh, so around 10 miles, 12 miles is going to take you an hour, which is around 18 kilometers. Uh, so bicycling, I take the same time. I actually take five minutes less when I bicycle because I don't hit any traffic. That's amazing. Uh, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, uh, I mean, is a bit I mean, faster I mean, than, than... I'm just thinking about uh, our contest here. I think, well, it depends, but generally speaking, speaking driving should be faster. Generally speaking, Unless yes, you're in but, gridlock traffic. Yeah, so, so I think that that's really what most of people experience, right? And... You, you were talking about some of the initiatives you're working on, but uh, it's really, it really boils down to what your use case is. So at least for me, the use case was commuting because that's where I spent a lot of time doing nothing, sitting, literally sitting, doing nothing. I mean, maybe listening to the radio a little bit, but that's it. Okay. Right? Uh, but uh, as I started biking, you know, it, it made me feel better. It, 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 just physically, you're, you're a lot more active. Uh, I clearly lost a little bit more hair, but uh, that's not my thing. It's just... <laughs> uh... So don't look at my hair, but uh, pretty much everything else, you know, it's, 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 it look, looks better. <laughs> oh, no worry. My, my, mine is finished, so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, I was going to ask, when you moved from this whole thing has to be sort of like a way of exercise and a hobby sort of to looking at it as a business because from the story you were explaining, yeah. it was more like certain biking for exercise, then things you said encountering problems with the bikes. Okay, fix a problem here, fix a problem here. Yeah. That is not the mind of somebody who wanted to do uh, this whole thing as a business. So what changed and how? Yeah. So what really changed is, and this happened very quickly. So I want to say 2016, 2017, there was a point in time where I actually, uh, it, it just hit me that I'd solved enough problems that whatever I had, other people could benefit from it. Okay. And that's really where this became real. So there were two people who literally stopped me while I was riding to work and said, well, this looks cool. Would you where did you buy it from? And I was like, man, I built it myself. And they said, well, can you build it for us? Wait, so uh, you yeah. actually added the batteries and the motors to your bike? Yeah. Yeah, I, I built the entire thing from scratch. So um, I came up with the geometry I liked uh, because I had a lot of back issues, the more I rode, you know, because I was riding a mountain bike. So mountain bikes are traditionally a little bit further away. Okay. Regular road bikes are a little bit closer, right? So. I was like, yeah, I need a bicycle that, that I can ride as a commuter. And so I built everything by myself. And by, by building everything by myself, I mean getting the right parts and assembling it into a packaged product, right? So at least okay. initial stuff. And then, so the first couple of people who bought from, who, who wanted this were, were people I literally just met riding. They're like, yeah, this looks fantastic. Would you build it for us? I was like, yep, absolutely. So it, it was more that people wanted People asked me, can you, can you develop this for me? And then I was like, yeah, I solved this problem. Would you, if you want it, I can absolutely do this. So that's how it got started. Okay. Yeah, so you, and, you, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was going to ask, uh, so that your the first bike, you basically went to buy the, the components on the shelf? Yeah, yeah. Some components of the shelf, some components didn't exist the way I wanted them to. So I had to come up with, with a 
with a different way of getting to those. So as an example, uh, uh, when, when people bicycle, uh, you know, it feels very natural. The harder you pedal, the faster you go, right? Fundamentally. But the motor kits that were available were not, didn't have this notion of sensing the amount of force you put in, right? So yeah. they were only, how fast are you pedaling? So they were only cadence sensing motors. So there would be times what where... Cadence sensing motors. Yeah, so, oh, so that, that's what it's, I want. It's a big word. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me explain that, right? So uh, today, uh, think of, uh, so I'll just make an analogy, right? So let's say you, you are pedaling. Okay. So there are two ways uh, you, the motor can provide, you, can provide you assistance. The first way is the easier way, is when you pedal, there's a piece in the motor that moves, very similar to your bottom bracket on your bicycle. It detects how fast it is moving, literally just how fast you're pedaling. Okay. And then it provides you assistance. Okay. It doesn't care how much force you're putting in to pedaling. It just cares how fast you're pedaling. Or you hands so, the word cadence. Just, that's it. That's hands the word cadence. Okay. However, cadence um, doesn't really provide a natural feel for bicycling you feel at some point in time, you can only pedal so fast, right? And you don't even have to pedal to get the assistance, right? So what happens is you're pedaling, you f you're just literally funny pedaling or ghost pedaling. All you want to do is trick the sensor into realizing that you're pedaling and the sensor will start providing the assistance, right? Okay. So there comes a point in time where after the first three or four times you pedal, you don't have to put any force at all. You literally just have to like a funny ghost pedaling. Yeah, yeah, it, it's literally the bicycle is going by itself, right? It's just detecting that you're pedaling, that's all. So it's not intelligent enough to realize that you're, you're not putting any force. Okay. So, so that is actually a, a more natural way of, of riding a bicycle, which is, you know, uh, torque sensing. So torque means the amount of force you put in on the pedal, right? Okay. So now the interesting thing about torque sensing, and th that's how most of the motors are, right? So we use the Bafang motor. Uh, 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 a lot of people use the Bosch motor. Uh, a lot of people also use the Yamaha motors and so on and so forth. So Yamaha, Bosch, Shimano, Bafang, these are the top four or five motor manufacturers traditionally. There, they don't do cadence sensing. They actually detect, so in that bottom bracket where your pedals where your crank arms fit, that bottom bracket actually has a, has a sensor which detects how are you twisting that bottom bracket, right? So how much force are you putting on that pedal to make it move? Okay. So the harder you pedal, the more assist it provides. So that is torque sensing. Okay, I, I think this is the point where you, 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 you can uh, share your slides with us because some of yeah, the descriptions absolutely. you are giving, I have a feeling that uh, some of us will not, I mean, we have to see the pictures to know the components we are referring to. Because what we understand is a bicycle is a bicycle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so let, me, let me show you uh, uh, what I mean by a torque sensing and a uh, 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 and a, uh, 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 cadence sensing, if you will, uh, okay. sensor, right? So, so let me share my screen and then I will, uh, let's, let's do this. Let me know once you can see it. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. So here, um, this is a grid technology. So they are one of the few vendors that, that, make a very a torque sensing bottom bracket right so mm -hmm. if you look at a traditional bicycle a traditional bicycle uh, bicycle right a traditional bicycle has some interesting parts to it right so if, let, let me let me bring that up so if you look at this bicycle you will notice that there are some parts that are that are like a regular bike you know here's the Here's the chain ring, here's the pedal, and the harder you pedal, the faster the bicycle moves. Okay. 
Now, this chain ring is actually tied to uh, a, a bottom bracket, right? So the, these, these pedal arms are tied to a bottom bracket. So let's look for a bottom bracket, okay? A bottom bracket uh, is a piece that goes through, if you can see this, a piece oh, that okay. actually goes, yeah, okay? Can you yeah, see this? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. So now this bottom bracket is really the core of what we are talking about. So okay. this bottom bracket has two sensors on it. So let's talk about sensor For one. For a bike, any bike at all? Every bike will have a bottom bracket. Okay. Now, the way e-bikes work is they will take this bottom bracket mm -hmm. and they will put it around a motor. Oh, they'll put a motor around this bottom bracket to drive the bottom bracket, right? So yeah. let's see what that means. So here is a bottom bracket, very similar to the one that you just saw here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what this does is, this actually has now an output. This output is, uh, let me see if I can give you a bigger image. So this output, this bottom bracket, has some wires coming in, coming out of it. Okay. It's a piece of electronic stuff. So the, the red and the black, you provide a little bit of current. The blue and the white, broadly speaking, will give you the current back with some signals, right? You yeah, capture like those. This. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's basically what it's doing. Now this measures the torque on the bottom bracket. So you will see that this part and this part are slightly different. So in the middle, there's a piece that calculates the difference between how far this is twisting versus how far this is twisting, Okay. right? And then it says, oh, okay, electronically, so that's different, then I need to provide additional assist. Okay. That's effectively what it's doing. Okay. So now let's look at how torque sensing motors work. So if, if you look at, torque sensing motors, sensing motor, what it will do is it'll embed this bottom bracket in, a, uh, in an assembly around it, right? So the same bottom bracket that you just saw, it is fitted right here, yeah? And around that is a motor. So think of a motor which has a chain. So internally, if you break this up, you'll see that this yeah, motor yeah, has really. gears, right? So that's all it's doing. So it's, it detects this, sends a signal to the motor, the motor does it faster, that's it. Now, how do you move this bottom rack? You're moving this with pedals. This pedal is one is on this side and one is on the other side of this chain ring, right? Okay. So there are two pedals. So as soon as it moves, the motor kicks in, boom, it's done. Okay. So this is an external motor design where this is you know, TS uh, DZ2. Some of the other designs out there are the Bafang motors. They're also very popular. Uh, you will see a lot of other motors, uh, uh, torque sensing, e-bike motor. There's a lot of uh, uh, other motors that are available, right? So Bafang now, is that's the one we use. So let's talk about the motor that we are using today, right? So torque sensing uh, Bafang Ultra. And, and that's really the motor that we use on our bike. So let's go to our page and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So this is our bike. Uh, this is the Ultimate Commuter Pro and this is the Cross Tour. Let's look at the Ultimate Commuter Pro and do a deep dive on, on what we're trying to get at. So here, you'll notice that this is the torque sensing, the, the, the bottom bracket that it goes through the thing. Uh -huh. Instead of the motor being below the torque sensing bracket, like you just saw on the other picture, right? The motor is in front, it's above. So now it's neatly packaged in one box instead of like this, it's like this. So there's not a lot of difference. Uh, where it adds a little bit of complication is now because it is a little bit above, you want to hold the motor. So you want to have a mold, which is not traditionally found in a, by a regular bicycle. So here is a different shot of the bike. You will see that the motor is now hung where your traditional your pedals will be. Right? Okay. So there's just a different way, but the concept remains the same. So as soon as you start pedaling, the motor kicks in, it provides a system, and then the bike goes, right? Okay. So that's fundamentally what it is. And, and here, uh, obviously, if you, if you go to our webpage, you can actually see how the bike does and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the, the, here, the big thing here is, and, and we were talking about you know, making this a little bit better. Uh, what we've done is we've now got rid of, uh, got rid of chains. So if you look at a, a traditional market where you want to service e-bikes or service bicycles, right? You'll notice that a lot of these bicycles even today have chains. <clears throat> and chains are good sometimes because they're easy to service if they break, you can even put some lube or grease on them and then they run. Uh, but uh, 
they also have an issue because uh, the longer you have the chain, and if you've ever ridden a bicycle, you will notice that the chain stretches, right? So yes. you, it, it falls off, it becomes loose. Yes, so uh, but uh, 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 a lot of challenge that uh, people who bike uh, face a lot. Yeah. The, the, the chain is yeah, so then the chain falls the chain off. The chain is dropping. The chain, is, if the chain dropping, drops all the time, then it hits you, tightness. and then it's greasy. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh my God, yeah. So what we've done is we've now switched to something called a belt drive. So very similar to the belt that you have in your car, in your front radiator, right? So those, okay. those belts can take a lot of torque, right? This is literally stuff that you find in, in, um, uh, in you, cars. You mean, you mean like this, uh, I don't know, I, I think this may be the wrong way, but it's like plastic cut off. Uh, These are carbon fiber. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, carbon fiber belt. I, I don't think I've ever seen a, a bike without a chain before. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's one, one of the big things, right? So uh, as, as electric vehicles grow, uh, and just as, as a segue, right? As electric vehicles grow, uh, we want the technology to be significantly better than the technology is today. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, so people will adopt it not just because it looks cool or it drives well, it, they, will, they will adopt it because it is leaps and bounds better than the existing set of technologies. Okay. So we have to take a holistic approach. So the other approach that we took here was reliability, right? So we didn't want chains on it because chains don't work in high temperatures, chains don't work very well when you, it's snowing outside, when it starts raining, they get all gunked up. Right? So there's a lot of disadvantages with chains. And if we expect to drive for a long time, we want something that is super reliable. So as an example, your engine runs around, what, 2,000 RPM? If it's idling, so let's do the math. So let's say 2,000 RPM, you ride your uh, bike every day for a one hour. So one hour is around 60 minutes. So that's another 60 seconds. So in one hour, you are actually riding your the, the, the belt million. has moved 7.2 million times and without breaking. Complete right? revolutions. That's exactly. And that's in one day. Right? So that's the type you know, of... That is like one hour per day. <laughs> that is one hour per day. So if the person happens to do two or three hours in a day, that number will double or triple. Right, exactly. So we have actually put in components here. So this carbon drive from Gates that can take that level of stress without breaking or go for that long without breaking. So as an example, just anecdotal, what I've noticed is for me, our chains uh, traditionally run out every 500 to 600 kilometers, right? Then you need a new chain. But with belts, um, I'm up to 6,000 miles, so around 10,000 kilometers, it still has to break. Wait, did you just say from 500 to 6,000? 6,000 miles, yeah. That's so quite that's a 10, jump. 10,000 kilometers. That's quite a jump, yeah. It's, it's literally orders of magnitude higher. That's like 10 times. Uh, Easily, yeah. Whoa. I know. I think I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> so well, you well, really I, have to think of that. Okay, uh, so let's, let's come to the uh, African uh, yeah. contest. Um, one, one thing that is, uh, makes this very important is because uh, in our part of the world, most of our population we use public transport, and mm -hmm. especially in the villages and even some parts of the urban centers, depending on the city or the country, they also use motorbikes, not yeah. bicycles. So mm -hmm. in the villages, you see a lot of bicycles. Then in the, some cities, you see a lot of motorbikes mm -hmm. because of traffic and also they are more easily affordable. Now, I want, I want to yeah. show a graphic here. Let's see. Trying to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So good. I, I hope you can see. Yep, I can. Yeah. Good, good, good. 
now with respect to so far we are, we are focused on the bicycles we didn't speak much about motorbikes but okay. with respect to even the bikes and then the the motorbikes these are and even electric vehicles in general these are the six objections that we generally hear in mm -hmm. our parts of the world yeah. as a matter of fact i i was just about four or five hours ago i was coming from a meeting mm -hmm. and one of the this person actually works in the renewable energy space um, had a lot of exposure and mm -hmm. amazingly he was telling us that he believes that EVs will take a long time to reach mass market in Africa because one of the reasons he gave was our roads. Our roads are bad. Okay. That's speaks to you, Mr. Chan. So maybe we'll pick it one by one. You can tell us how uh, this e bikes that you have you are using have an effect on us. First of all, uh, with respect to price, yeah. what is the price? We, 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 we feel that it is going to be very expensive. So tell us a bit more about that, about the price. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that, that, is a, that is a fair uh, statement as of today, but the, the good part is it's coming down. So if you, if you, if you take the, the E part out of it, so if you take the batteries out of it, uh, the, the primary EV has two big components or price components, actually three. One would be, you know, the infrastructure, the chassis itself, which means the motorcycle mm -hmm. with, the, with the seat and the handle and the, and the frame and the front shocks and the front tire, rear tire. So that cost is the same whether it is an electric vehicle or a gas vehicle or a, a petrol vehicle. Where it differs is uh, the motor is also going to be some, somewhat of a wash. The engine is going to be somewhat of a wash, right? Instead of having an internal combustion engine, now you have a, a motor that is almost like your, you know, uh, your electric motor that you might buy, find in a food processor, just a bigger, better variation of that motor. Okay. So that is also a wash in terms of, you know, the cost. So the only additional cost that we are talking about is the cost of the battery. All right. And that's, that's really what it is. So batteries, uh, when, when we started off, it was around, I wanna say, uh, a bulk pricing. So batteries, we, we typically measure in kilowatt hours, right? That's the amount of energy that's needed. So as an example today, uh, if, if you look at it, uh, a Tesla, whether that's one of the premier electric vehicles, they take around 250, uh, uh, you know, watt hours per mile or per 1.6 kilometers, right? So give or take Wait. around. Can, can you explain that? Is it 250 watts? Yeah. Per mile. So the amount of energy needed to move the car along with the passengers for one mile is 250 watt hours. Good. Right? Give or take, right? Approximately. So if you normalize that to a kilometer, let's say it's around 180 watt hour per kilometer. Let's use that as a reference. And I'll, I'll tell you what that means. So okay. uh, let's say somebody gave you a big battery pack uh, and, and uh, some of my uh, advisors, so for example, Ravi Kempaya, who's a battery engineer and Professor Jeff Tan, uh, who, who, who's one of the prominent battery scientists, they would probably have better explanations for this. But let's say uh, somebody gave you a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. Okay. So if you now divide 100 kilowatt hour battery pack divided by 180, all things remaining equal, you should be able to go around 500 kilometers on one charge of that huge battery, okay? Okay. As an example. So, so there's a cost to having the ability to store these, this amount of energy. So electric vehicles cost a lot more upfront, right? So your battery cost is going to drive up your average cost of the motorcycle, let's say by around 30 to 40%, right? So as an example, just in US dollars, if you're saying that your traditional bike uh, motorcycle costs, let's say 2000 US dollars, an equivalent range 
electric motorcycle is going to cost you around three thousand to to four thousand. Yeah, give or take. And and a big chunk of that that delta is going to be the battery cost of the battery. Okay. So 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 you're jumping from let's use small numbers for the sake yeah. of uh, clarity. So let's say if a normal bicycle costs hundred dollars. Yeah, normal bicycle costs hundred dollars for an equivalent performing range because we're talking about range. That's the other okay. thing on your thing. It's going to be around one sixty to one eighty dollars. Okay. Okay. So the that is that is, is like sixty percent more. Sixty to eighty percent more. Yeah. So now the, the 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 one thing to keep in mind though is the regular motorcycle is not ready to run yet. You still have to fill gasoline in it or petrol in it, right? It's so, a continuing expense. It's a continuing expense. So the way to look at it is if you take your motorcycle today <coughs> and a regular motorcycle and keep filling it with petrol and running it every 100 miles and so on and so forth, there comes a time where around, you know, around the 30, a thousand kilometer mark, depending on the price of the batteries, that at that point in time, the amount of petrol you've put in or the amount of gasoline you've put in is equivalent to the amount of petrol, amount of batteries you bought up front on an electric vehicle, right? Yeah. So with batteries, you pay up front, but with petrol, you pay, 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 all the way till you get some mileage or, or kilometers and then both are the same. With petrol, your cost is still gonna go up because you have to keep filling petrol if you have to drive more. But with batteries, the cost remains the same. You've already paid for it up front. But an argument can be made that uh, with the electric bikes, we need to charge it with electricity. That's exactly right. The, the difference here is electricity rates are going down. And one of the things you've, you've highlighted as part of our initial discussions is the cost of electricity is actually decreasing every year. As more capacity comes online, traditionally, uh, it's cheaper to produce the same amount of electricity. It's more efficient to produce the same amount of electricity than using that amount of petrol or gasoline, right? So you're absolutely right. However, the, the rate at which petrol, uh, uh, the price for petrol rises or, or the amount of petrol that is needed is much faster than the amount of money you want to spend on the electrical stuff. So as an example, if we now extrapolate that to uh, uh, to some of the charts that you we, we've discussed in the past, to drive 100 kilometers Maybe on on a I gasoline vehicle, yeah, about. let's share that chart, right? So if you if you wanted to let's say ride 100 kilometers, uh, you know, which is around 60 miles, traditionally with gasoline, you're looking at anywhere between 15 dollars to 30 dollars worth of gasoline, depending on what country you're in. But okay. with electricity. Absolutely, that, that's that's a great one, right? So, okay. uh, so, so, so now, it, uh, maybe there is like a contest. So, this is a a, a chart for twenty three African countries. Yeah, their energy prices as of November twenty nineteen. Yeah, that's right. So, on a per liter basis, you will notice that let's say uh, the average price is somewhere around the one dollar per liter, right? So, I'm just going to take that one dollar per liter, okay. and uh, if you want to do 100 kilometers, you are, uh, you know, it takes anywhere between, depending on the type of vehicle, it takes anywhere between 15 to 20 dollars worth of, uh, uh, anywhere between seven to 15 dollars worth of petrol. Right? And diesel, the average efficiency is even less, so you need more, right? Okay. However, if you look at an equivalent thing on electricity, you will notice that to do 100 kilometers, you probably just need under a dollar of electricity. But, so, but, but, you know, um, with the, the, the thing with this uh, data is that you realize that it is highly dependent on the country. So if you look at a country yes. like Zimbabwe, quite yep. the, 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 the difference between uh, petrol electricity is basically non-existent. And you actually have, happen to have the highest energy prices on the continent now. Yeah. The, the, the argument uh, for the cost savings, it, it comes off, disappears in a way. It loses its strength, if I may say so. Yeah, I mean, over a period of time, yes, absolutely, right? I mean, I, 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 it all depends on you know, government policies, trade policies, 
what, where are the incentives going? Where are the subsidies going? And it is in a vacuum, uh, just taking Zimbabwe without knowing oh, what those uh, tariffs are or policies are. Uh, it would be hard to make that case, absolutely. So, so, so uh, the other side of the cost uh, arguments obviously has to do with uh, maintenance. So we are, we are talking about, we spoke about the purchase price. Then yeah. we, spoke, we spoke about uh, operating or fueling. Yeah. Then so, the so other I just side is. The purchase. So before you move on, right? So before, so just on the purchase price, as as we discovered, right? If you wanted to do a hundred kilometers as a as a as a good target, right? So your price for gasoline, if you look at let's say you look at Ghana or you look at Nigeria, the first three, four, five, pretty much anybody other than Zimbabwe, you will notice that electricity is significantly cheaper and has better efficiencies to get you there faster, right? So what it translates to is for every kilometer, every hundred kilometers you travel, you save between six to Fourteen dollars worth of money, right? So, so as as a frame of reference, before we move on to the other costs, and that is huge. That is huge. That's huge. Uh, and in our experience, it's one, it's one of some of the things that uh, people don't really look at. They don't look at the numbers and the facts in a way. Yeah. So, you were going to talk about the maintenance. Well, that's yeah, also another that's huge, and, and if it has a yeah. bearing on uh, infrastructure, let me go back to uh, where the others, other, other, so maintenance. Yeah. What's the difference between- So maintenance between... is another one, right? So th that's another thing that I, I sort of discovered that if you're looking at, let's say an electric motorcycle, the maintenance drops dramatically dramatically. Because how does a traditional motorcycle work today? It works on a lot of oils, a lot of petroleum. You have to clean it up, you have to go for servicing, clean the carburetor, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of moving parts there, there are gears, ratios built in. There's a lot of stuff that's going on and it needs maintenance. So with electrical stuff, that level of maintenance just drops dramatically. You know, outside of your traditional tires wearing down or your grips, there is really the, the overall maintenance of the drivetrain, if you, if you want to call it, right? Which is the motor, the, the, the chain or the belt that goes in. That's it. These things are rated for, you know, 300, 400,000 miles. So you're really not going to experience as frequent a failure to maintain the bike, the, the, uh, the motorcycle. Now, with, with, with everything else, we have to still prepare for the worst, right? So, so in terms of maintenance, I think the skill sets that need, are needed are traditionally around uh, handling higher voltage electronics or power systems, right? So you will notice that the batteries are 52 volts, 60 volts, 72 volts, 100 volts, right? So you really need uh, to retool uh, and, and have people who are comfortable and have the safety training to handle high voltage uh, power systems. So uh, this guy, you, you, you mean uh, people who have electrical engineering or electrical technicians? Electrical like, technicians, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers who can sort of supplement with electrical stuff. So you really need those types of skill sets uh, or retool from, you know, to those types of skill sets to effectively service failures. And failures can happen mostly either the battery pack level which means you really need to understand high voltages and see what's uh, coming in and how to fix those. But the second part would be the motor actually breaks, in which case you need to look at windings, you need to look at gears, internal gears that are there, and so on and so forth. So, so basically, if I understand you correctly, it means that uh, somebody who is a traditional, let's say, motorcycle repairer may mm -hmm. not be able to repair an electric, bike, uh, uh, electric motorbike. So, motorcycle. Actually, uh, so uh, just a funny anecdote. So, <laughs> I, I would say that people who repair uh, bikes today are nearly eighty percent there in terms of repairing electric bikes, because really? they actually, yeah, because they actually understand how parts move. So, one of the big things I've noticed is, if you go to a, I mean, I'm, I'm going to use bicycle as an analogy, is. Uh, 
a lot of you know bicycle shops would initially shy away from repairing stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, it's still a bicycle. It still has a wheel. It still has that chain. It still has spokes. You know, you still have to pedal. It still has a handlebar. Most of the repairs are really not related to the motor or the battery. And when it comes to the motor or the battery, it turns out uh, that most of the repairs can be done by just simply swapping out parts. You don't oh, need okay. to spend time to repair them because those parts are they're, they're not like super complicated parts. Yeah, they're, they're exactly. It's probably easier to replace them and refurbish them than to try to repair them, right? Okay. So repairing an electrical component becomes, now, now there's, there's an opportunity here because uh, if, if you look at uh, some nations, for example, uh, uh, I've noticed some of uh, the EV revolutions happening in the Asian subcontinent, you will notice that now because there's a easy swap out rate, there's a big secondary market of piece that can be refurbished, remanufactured, and put back in the supply chain, right? So the right. next time you come in and you want to swap out that part, you can have somebody else who is actually an electrician who can rewind the motor, right? Test it and say, okay, this is good, performs well. And then the next time somebody else's motor breaks, they can put in that core again, right? So it really spurs economies and, and, and skill sets and, and the ability to repair not just at a point level, which is your bike, but also there are subsequent opportunities for people to, to you know, uh, train and, and, uh, and create secondary markets around it. So it's, it's very cool the way it works. Okay, so, 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 so um, what you are saying is that in our part of the world, for example, where a lot of uh, our mechanics uh, is basically artisanal training, it's not like uh, they went to any formal school. Yeah. But okay, you, you have a master who taught you this is how you, you, you are saying that these people can be able to maintain these e bikes. Yeah, very easily. Absolutely. So, in terms of I mean, breakages, how often do they break? compared to the normal uh, motorcycles and uh, bicycles. Right, so some of the brake stuff is normal across whatever vehicle you use, right? Your tires, if you have a puncture in your tire or your flats, if you will, they will happen because it's a normal vehicle. Uh, okay. But usually electric motors for motorcycles especially are rated for you know 30,000 kilometers, sorry, 30,000 miles around 45,000 kilometers or 100,000 kilometers or 200,000 kilometers. So your mean time between failure could be, could be fairly significant, right? So for the motor to break, you really have to push it to 30, 40, 50,000 kilometers before things start breaking. Okay, so uh, what about the normal petrol uh, or diesel, sorry, petrol bikes? Yeah. What is their rating so, compared to the e-bikes? Because e-bikes are saying it's 200,000. Yeah, again, mean time between failures, right? But uh, with uh, uh, with non e bikes or not regular like trucks and motorcycles, you have to go and do an oil change pretty much every three thousand kilometers, right, or five thousand kilometers. Uh, which so by you have to do the oil change, you have to do the filter changes because the gasoline is coming in. You have to have carburetors retuned. Uh, every 10,000 kilometers and so on and so forth. So there's a sequence of maintenance that needs to happen just to, just to keep the engine running. And with the electric bike, you don't need to do any of this. Yeah. It's good to go for the 200,000 kilometers without any maintenance. Yeah, or, or as much as possible, right? I mean, everything can break if you abuse it, but the chances are of something breaking uh, is less okay, because yeah, these less. are really over, overbuilt. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So in a way, so, there is a huge opportunity to to switch and pay up front rather than you know pay slowly over time because slowly over time you're actually going to pay significantly more. Okay, but but, but from, from what you said, it means that about the upfront upfront price, once the cost of batteries continue to decline, yeah. there's a possibility that you get to the point where the batteries will be so cheap that there will be cost parity. So I would say they could get better than cost parity. 
cost parity at some point. However, the, the important thing to note here is, is that really stopping the, the electric revolution, right? Because how are we incentivizing people to switch? So one of the things as you mentioned is the infrastructure. So if we build an infrastructure that incentivizes people to have an electric vehicle as opposed to having a petrol vehicle, that, that matters. I mean, if you have more chargers, people are more willing to invest in something that is at a lower cost. So as an example, today, uh, at least in the US, we buy a car that has the maximum range of 300 miles or around 450 kilometers, right? Okay. Or around 500 kilometers. But every day, as I mentioned, my work trip is only 36 kilometers, right? So <laughs> do I really need to buy a battery that will stretch for 500 kilometers? No. Maybe, you, maybe just, you may take a trip once a year, you may. Once a year, and in which case I will, you know, if there were enough chargers along the way, I can charge that battery. So you can actually get done with a smaller battery to offset the cost as long as the infrastructure exists. So there are different ways of approaching that problem. And I think as, as uh, and I remember this from India uh, when, when I was growing up, you know, we, we didn't have uh, a lot of uh, good landline infrastructure, the telephone infrastructure. So the jump was made from your traditional uh, 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 landlines or telephone it's lines true. directly to cell phones. So from, right, yeah. we, we never had, <laughs> you know. I think that, that, that's basically the story of the developing world, including Africa. Yeah. You can make giant leaps. So if, if the, the leap is around building a good infrastructure, your actual cost of, of, of uh, having that motorcycle will be nearly the same as, as that of your today, motorcycle today. Okay, so in, with respect to infrastructure, you know, yeah. uh, in Africa, I... I believe that almost all the countries use 240 volts. Yeah. Okay. So let's say if you have an electric motorbike or an electric yeah. bicycle. Yeah. Can you just use the normal wall connector? In America, you have 110 volts. So that is, uh, it gives you issues. But here, if you're using 240 volts, do we need any special infrastructure to, you know, to charge? Uh, your bicycle or your... That's a great point, yeah. So, so the short answer is um, for uh, bicycles and motorcycles, the answer is no, not really. The current infrastructure will work just as well uh, for the most part. And, and the reason for that is uh, you can actually choose to charge your vehicle when you're not riding it, which is usually at night, right? So let's say eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, you can come back home or your place of business, plug it in. And even if the charging happens at, I think today, at least, you know, most of the times it is 240 volts and five amperes or 240 volts and 15 amperes. That's your traditional outlet, right? That's yeah. plenty to charge your uh, electric bicycle or motorbike overnight, which will give you a good, you know, 100 to 200 kilometers worth of range. Uh, absolutely, no problem. Right? So by the time you come in in the morning, the, the, the stuff is ready to go. It, it becomes a little bit different when you are talking about cars or bigger vehicles, because okay. those battery packs are really big, right? I and mean, as I talked about, they could be 30 kilowatt hours, 50 kilowatt hours, 100 kilowatt hours. Yeah. Uh, and those just need a different level of infrastructure. So that has to be done, uh, not just purely in terms of you know, individual plug points, but that, that really needs massive interest, not massive infrastructure investments, but just, you know, a more robust, more high voltage infrastructure. You know, one of the interesting questions that um, keep asking uh, coming up is uh, this chicken and egg situation when it comes to infrastructure. So there are uh, some organizations are interested in setting up charging stations, but they want to be sure that there are enough vehicles or electric bikes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before they invest. Yeah. And then people are also waiting to be sure that there are enough charges before they will 
buy uh, electric vehicles. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting conversation. And, and all the time, I, I, I always say that if you look at Norway, which one came yeah. first? Is it the bike or, sorry, is it the electric vehicle or the charges? Anyway, so, yeah. I, I wanted us to uh, go to performance. Yeah, that is a performance. Yeah, absolutely. So, so but, 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 but before we go, another question for you personally: How long does it take to charge your uh, bicycle or your motorbike? Right. So, so we we uh, provide uh, fast charging capabilities up to ten amps. Uh, so you can charge the bike. Uh, the battery that our battery is around eight hundred eighty watt hour pack. So at 10 amps, or so let's say eight amps, it takes around two, two and a half hours to charge the battery from zero to 100. Okay. But more often than not, I'm not discharging the battery all the way to zero, right? I'm probably, once I come back home, it's like 30%, 40%, something like that. So usually the battery can be charged like an hour and a half, no problem. Okay. What is fast charging? And how does it depend from normal charging? Okay. So the only difference is uh, the amount of power that you're supplying to the battery pack. And there are clearly other other things around the battery management system. Can it really handle? But think of when you when you put your put your charger in the outlet, the outlet is giving you in in, in your case around 240 volts and around five amperes of current. Right? Uh, fast charging would be 240 volts, but maybe 10 amperes of current. More so current. it's literally developing the amount of uh, increasing the amount of current that comes into the bike. That's it. So, so does that mean that we need special equipment for that? No, not really, no. I mean, usually the battery management systems that are in addition to the, the cells, there's a battery management system. Those can, those can typically, uh, I mean, at least nowadays, they go all the way up to 10 amps. That's somewhat the charging standard. So you don't really need to worry about it too much. So in other words, you just connect your, your, your charger to the socket and the charger will be the rest. Okay, yeah, that's that's exactly. yeah. I mean, it's like how most of your laptop chargers are built, right? It doesn't matter if it's 110, 115, 240, 250, it just works. Okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine, fantastic. Yeah. So let's talk about performance. Yeah. So performance now in the electrical space uh, or electric space means a lot of different things. Performance could be, is your vehicle able to get to you know, some zero to let's say 60 kilometers an hour quickly? So what is your pickup performance? The other performance could be, what is the energy that is needed to sustain a level of speed over a period of time? Third could be long-term performance, right? Over a period of time, does these do these things get worse than when we bought them, right? So does it take more fuel, more battery to do the exact same thing? Okay. So electrical vehicles, for the most part, shine in terms of all three. So obviously, because they are electrical current, you can give it more amps and th that thing is going to go, right? I mean, it's you, you've seen the Teslas and the new <laughs> Porsche Taycan. So yeah, you, you pump it in, you just go. So there's really no comparison there. So that would be unfair for the for the um, petrol vehicles. But uh, let's talk about sustaining. Uh, electricity is, you know, uh, what, 60, 80 percent as efficient as uh, gasoline vehicles. So gasoline vehicles are only 30 to 40 percent efficient. So the amount of electricity needed to maintain the speed is significantly lower uh, than, than uh, compared to petrol. And the longer period of time, uh, the your mileage uh, miles per gallon or kilometers per liter uh, actually get worse with an older vehicle, right? Because the parts wear down, your ignition is not happening the right way. A lot of maintenance is needed to keep at the same level. But with an electric motor, there's not a lot of moving parts except for that one rotor which keeps moving, right? So your performance degradation, at least in the hardware, is not that bad. The only thing you will notice is there's a performance degradation in terms of the battery pack, right? So originally you could charge it all the way up to 100%, but now with similar to your you know, phones, you know, the charge only goes up to 95%. So you will notice that the battery retaining ability goes down a little bit, but there's a lot of research being done right now where uh, you have uh, battery packs that can last, last you for um, you know, 6,000 cycles, 10,000 cycles. And by cycles, I mean you know, charging it all the way to 100, bringing it down all the way to 100, discharging it to 100, right? So let's say you, you charge one time a day, uh, there are 365 days a year, so that's 365 cycles. When I talk about 6,000 cycles, that's 20 years. 
right? So the battery packs that are now rated for 20 years with minimal change or drop in capacity, right? So the technology is already there. So, 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 so does that mean that uh, the charges, I'm talking about the charging cycles, let's say if I charge to, I discharge to 20% and I charge, that is not a full, is that going to be considered a full cycle? So usually the definition of full cycle is, so let's say a battery has 100 watt hours of capacity. You, you discharge it to 20, you bring it up, you have to discharge more 20 to get to 100, right? So that is typically counted as a full cycle. Full cycle is the whole 100 watt hour of capacity, more definition. Has been used up. Used up, yeah, which, used up capacity. Which means that, let's say if for the next five years, I don't discharge the battery completely. I just charge halfway. I just discharge halfway and charge fully. So that will be half. I may yeah. extend the. That's exactly right. Wow. So, so right now, as an example, the batteries that we sell, if you do a hundred percent discharge, they are rated for around uh, six hundred uh, to seven hundred cycles. Okay. There's also some you know, nuance about the way you charge them and so on and so forth. But broadly speaking, but if you only do halfway, you're effectively doubling the lifetime of the battery. So now I'm using the same battery pack for three years. That's nearly a thousand cycles. And I see very little degradation of battery capacity because I don't fully discharge it. So that sort of carries on. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, what about range? Um, I, 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 that's it. Range is the uh, big, big range. Range is king. Is it range is king. So, range so, is king. So, 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 so um, in our part of the world, we have something called one gallon. Uh -huh. uh, one gallon, even today, like I said, the bit that that concept came up. So one gallon means that, so maybe somebody doesn't have enough money to buy enough fuel. So he want, we buy one gallon of fuel. Okay. Okay. Or he have a, a, just a minimal amount of fuel in his tank. Then yeah, as yeah. he's driving, a lot of the, some of the cars to the, Fuel gauge doesn't work, okay. <laughs> or it works but you ignore it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. you are driving, and then you reach a certain point, your, your car stops moving because it's out of fuel. Then you pick up your jerry can, go to the nearest fuel station, yeah. and buy one gallon of fuel to top up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, now, here is the constant you face with an electric car. You cannot easily buy one charge. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> so, so if if, if if you are going to be using electric car, you must be damn sure that you have yes. enough range out of the gate. Absolutely, yeah. The range is, yeah, is huge, and, and is you, huge. you know that it affects even the charging infrastructure. Because the bigger the range right. of the car, the less infrastructure you may need. Right, and, and I think that is really where uh, a lot of the focus is going to go. Right. So range uh, and infrastructure are the two pillars, I think, to sort of jumpstart the EV revolution. Uh, because uh, if you look at how people drive their vehicles, whether it's a bike or a motorcycle, they're probably just driving it for, let's say, in an eight hour, like a nine to five type of cycle. You know? You're driving your vehicle for two hours, maybe. The rest of the time, you're just waiting around. Either it's parked somewhere, Either it's parked at your office or it's parked at a client site, right? So there's ample opportunity if the infrastructure exists where if you just park in a parking lot and if there's a plug to keep charging it, so by the time you come out, let's say 15 minutes, you, you have your range back, right? So when, when we charge, so what the ways of battery charge is, you know, the first 80%, you can get there very, very quickly very quickly. It's only the 80 to 100% that takes the longest time, right? So if, if your motorcycle was just sitting there and if you have a PowerPoint that you can just plug point that you can plug your charger into, by the time you deliver your parcel or pick up your parcel or meet your friend or have a coffee, your bike is charged and ready to go. So range, if you have the right type of infrastructure approach, is really not a problem as long as the infrastructure exists to support this and the ability of people to realize that, you know what? Yeah, 
keep your, it's, it's like using your phone, right? You can only have so much battery in your phone, but you always want your phone to work. So what do people do today? They carry their chargers everywhere. You carry your charger everywhere. I carry my charger everywhere, right? You have chargers all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you, so that, I think that, that's really an infrastructure play, right? Uh, with with batteries, uh, as you said, if if you don't need to, if you don't need to add new infrastructure, you can just piggyback off your regular sockets and just plug things in. As long as that's available, uh, uh, again, it's it's more a, a way of approaching it. But I, I strongly feel that that's where uh, uh, infrastructure has to go. Range will be an issue, but it is not going to be an issue for, I want to say, 70 to 75% of the use cases that we want EVs for. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the thing about the range uh, question is that, you know, uh, for Africa and the developing world, our policy space is a bit different. Uh, mm -hmm. It tends to be a bit unconventional to use the word. Okay. So a lot of times policy follows adoption. Yeah. Okay. Not the other way around. Yeah. And, and, and if you want to wait for policy to catch up, it, can, it, may, it may wait for a long time. So yeah. somebody who is buying uh, an electric motorbike, for example, wants to know that, okay, if a single charge, most of when I'm living in the house, I can go comfortably and come back uh, comfortably without yep. having to charge midway along yes. my journey, when the yes. my journey. So can, can you talk to us a bit about what goes into the range of, uh, let's say, an electric bike? If you are designing an electric bike, uh, at what way gone? Wagons, yeah. sorry. So if you are, well, what goes into the, yeah. the cost, uh, so the range? That's right, yeah. So, so I would say that uh, 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 range is really, I, mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. With electric vehicles, um, I would say, depending on the use case, for a, for a motorcycle, I would say between 100 to 150 kilometer range is perfectly fine. That's how, how long people are going to ride, for, ride on, on on a daily basis, right? So that's around what three thousand kilometers a month. That's around let's say ten times, let's say thirty thousand kilometers a year. That's typically how long people, how much people ride if you're really using it for like a business purpose. So that type of range you can get just by charging it one time overnight, uh, for the most part. So there is there is a happy medium where every morning when you come in, your your electric bike is ready to go. Oh, a bit like your smartphone. Yeah, that's exactly right. You charge overnight. In the morning, it's ready to go. It's always 100%. Okay. Right? So. <clears throat> I understand, I understand. Anyway, I think we have, oh, choice and variety. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. that, that, that goes to, <laughs> in fact, I'll I, 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 I ask that question this way. Where do you see uh, this space going? I'm talking about the electric uh, bikes and uh, motorcycles. Where do you see this space going in terms of variety? Right. So electric, electric bicycles are, are, are at a sort of a, you know, depending on what country you're in, electric bicycles have already been sort of adopted. So if you go uh, to the Nordic countries, if you go to Germany, if you go to, uh, uh, the, the Netherlands, you know, the, the, the significant adoption of electric vehicles because the, the cities and towns are closer. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of different use cases associated with electric bikes, you know, cargo bikes. They are now supplanting your pedicabs and regular cabs and so on and so forth. They are even being used for short haul trailers. So as an example, if you wanted to move, let's say around five cubic meters worth of stuff, instead of putting it on a truck, you can actually they take three or four trips on your bicycle and be done with it, right? It's a cheaper, cheaper, better uh, way. If you look at uh, countries like the US, we are still not at the tipping point yet because our distances are larger. Our cities are much further apart. The infrastructure doesn't exist to support it. So for us, um, uh, 
part of it is adoption. We are still at an adoption stage. Uh, we have the infrastructure in terms of charging, but we don't have the uh, uh, capacity to have that many bicycles on the road, whether it's e-bikes or even electric motorcycles. Now, in terms of where it's going, uh, just on a bicycle stuff, uh, bicycles has, still have a lot of moving parts, right? You have gears, you want to change your gears, you want to have the clutch and all that. So you will see a lot of innovation around motors themselves having everything built in, right? Once you put it in drive, it automatically goes and it's almost like driving, you know, you, the faster you throttle, the more current you give, the faster it goes, right? You don't have to keep changing gears. So it reduces that. So there's a lot of innovation that is coming down the pike around um, seeing simplification of the whole bicycle. Okay. Uh, then uh, right now we, we spend a lot of time about chains, right? Chains are needed because your motor is in the center of the bicycle. Now imagine if the motor is actually on one of the wheels. At that point, you don't need chains. So you've removed another part. These are called hub motors. So there's a lot of, you know, a, a big variety and choice that is now available where you don't need chains anymore. You literally have two wheels. One of the wheels is actually tied to the motor itself and just spins. And okay. the front wheel is the front wheel, right? So. So the entire thing will move without you really needing any chain or anything like that. But that has uh, significant cost implications. Significant cost implications, absolutely. It simplifies it. Not only is it the cost of the bike itself, but it's the cost of maintenance that goes down. So, 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 so let's bring that to the developing world. Yeah. How do you, as somebody who is outside looking in. Obviously, your, your, your background is you are from India, so we have some perspective there. Uh, how do you see this playing out? I, I think, uh, and again, uh, my, my uh, opinions are still, you know, sort of informed by rudimentary data sets that I've seen so far, right? Um, okay. I think uh, there are a couple of things that need to change dramatically. One is, incentive for people to switch. I think that is a big, big deal because uh, I remember when I was a young kid, I mean, we, we had the same Vespa scooter for 12 years, 13 years, right? And it was riding just fine. You don't need to change it. I mean, <laughs> my dad bought it, I'm riding it, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, the parts are still available, but there's an, every, every year, there's so much maintenance that used to go in, right? The parts used to break, um, there's a lot of maintenance needed, the oil changes and so on and so forth. So, so there has to be an incentive for people to sort of switch from that model to an electric model. So, and that's where the government, I think, comes in. Uh, 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 Second, when, you, when you say incentive, what do you mean? What do you have in mind? You have in mind? So you need to sort of, uh, sometimes you need to subsidize uh, or, or provide credits or tax credits in order for people to switch, right? Okay. Make it meaningful. So today, let's say I'm in the market for a new bike, if the bike is, as, as you said, costing 40, 50, 60% more, you know, that's a big, big cost up front. Can you, can the government subsidize that for me a little bit and bring it in, in, in line with, uh, uh, with, with the regular bike, with a non-battery bike, right? So that's one lever that, that's at a government level. At, at a traditional level, at an individual level, the, the concept of, as you said, adoption. So you need, to have, you need to have charging infrastructure so you can start charging cafes a lot of business opportunities there. You know, typically people, as you would anticipate, people who have already bought an electric uh, vehicle are used to paying a little bit more, you know? <laughs> so, because they've bought an electric vehicle. So, so you, can, you can charge them a little bit more for charging, for providing value-added services, for a better cup of coffee, you know, simple things. Uh, uh, and that's where a lot of individual businesses come in. And that's what we are seeing in the United States, at least, where you will see these charge cafes coming up where you know, they provide value-added services. You know, hairdressing, even though I don't have hair, I usually go to cut my hair where charging is available, right? Okay. So it's simple so, things so, like that. So, that can so happen. charging is becoming like a utility. Exactly. A bit like charging Wi-Fi. A like, bit like Wi-Fi. You're going to go to a place that has better Wi-Fi, right? So something like that. So I think those are some of the levers that I can think of right now. I'm sure there's more, but just uh, from, a, from a, a developing nation perspective, I think those things exist. I mean, a lot of, people are already tuned to, you know, making the best of what they have. And today, these are very easy to get. You know, charging infrastructure is easy to do. Uh, uh, 
buying electric vehicle is easy to do. So things like that definitely start to matter. Well, uh, uh, in our experience, I think uh, in terms of the policy space, the, the mm -hmm. general consensus seems to be that, oh, these days will take a long time to come to, uh, in our case, Africa. So yeah. the policy makers, they sort of, some, some of them, they say something about it, but there's not a serious concerted effort to okay. drive adoption. Uh, so which means that if you're depending on policy makers, we are out. Uh, yeah. We also yeah. see that, uh, I think we, the, the last time I was telling you this, uh, that communities are being had, but the community does not include uh, the developing world. I, I just want to sh sh show you something. Yeah. Uh, it's something that you know, but I, I don't think you, you, you have to talk about it. Uh, before I was going to show you what is this? The screen, okay. That's my screen. I want to show you. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, I can. This is uh, the Tesla Sport Sport Jam map, right? Can you see something? Yeah, 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 the yeah, yeah. What's the global? Wow. I'm looking for the global one. Is is it any time I see it? It's, it's very, very interesting. Okay. So, you will see that. No, I, there's a I, lot I of, there's a lot of, it. there's a lot of lights in it. <laughs> okay, this is from, that's why I so, right? so what I would say is there is a, there is a distinction between what you're seeing here versus uh, the use case we are describing. The use case we are describing okay. is that all electric vehicles can actually be charged at home overnight. Good. The dots that you see on the screen are only needed if you are actually doing 150, 200, 300 kilometers a day. Okay, they are only needed if you're really doing that much travel. For all other travel, even for people like me, the number of, I've gone to the supercharger on my electric car, probably once a month, if that. I always charge at home. Overnight, in the morning, the charge is full and ready to go. Which car do you use? Which electric car do you drive? That's exactly right, yeah. And, and, and that's really where, where, where the, the graph that you showed earlier makes a lot more sense, right? The electricity production in some of the African countries is just phenomenal, right? You have a lot of solar, you have a lot of green sources of electricity. That is really going to be the differentiating factor. You already have the capacity to produce, you know, the, the raw uh, uh, energy needed to, to power this EV revolution. I, 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 the, the reason why I was showing you the graph, okay, was not with the with the charging per se, but to demonstrate something that uh, mm -hmm. communities have been hard, but Mm -hmm. The community is not including the developing nations. So I the see. Chinese are having conversations. They are making some policy decisions. They are driving it. The Europeans are making decisions. The Americans are having discussions. Uh, nobody knows where they may end up. Rather, they are going one way. It seems that, they, I mean, it is a yeah. mm -hmm. party, the media, they go a different way. Yeah. But you don't hear, say, the Brazilians are having these discussions. Or even when the manufacturers, US manufacturers are having these discussions, you don't hear them including the developing world as a priority. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that's, yeah, that's probably true. I, I'm not somewhat more privy to that, but I, but I, can, I can sense what you're saying. And that's probably, uh, uh, you know, those who adopt faster get to make the policies, I would guess. So wherever uh, electric vehicles are already available and being adopted, so they get first dibs, I would, I would say that is one way of looking at it. I, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm out of my depth when it comes to you know, policy, uh, making policy decisions at that level, but, but I completely get the point you're trying to make. Uh, yeah, there is, there is a, that's a great observation. Anyway. So, so you, you, you did say, well, once you are winding now, you did say that you would drive an electric car. I was wondering, I was asking which car 
which you should, you should model is that? Yeah, so I, I drive a Tesla a Model 3. Okay. Yeah. How long have you had it and what was the experience? Uh, uh, it's it's fantastic. It's 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 like really uh, one of those things that absolutely changes your perception about driving, uh, and that's because, uh, as I said, when when you drive an electric vehicle, there's a significant decrease in the number of moving parts, and Tesla has taken that next level and also decreased the number of moving parts that you see when you sit in the car, right? So there's not a lot of okay. buttons to press, you know. Uh, so it's literally yeah, one, one big screen. Drive, yeah, one big screen and one button that says drive. Okay, you go. You know, there, there's not a lot of you know turning, twisting stuff. It just get in and go. Uh, the other part of it is um, they are able to innovate at a much rapid pace because they have added this level of hardware and software support on top of it, which really makes for better long-term ownership. So for example, if I want a feature which says, okay, uh, if I press the, the left uh, turn signal, but I know I'm not turning after a little bit, you know, turn it off, right? Yeah, they, they can actually push out a software update, which you can make that configurable by the end user. Or what, what we, they just did is, if you're in a dark spot, if you're driving in, at the night and you don't see if the lights are on, It'll detect the amount of ambient light coming in and it'll go to high beam, right? Stuff that was not there when I bought the car, but it is there now, right? So as it learns, it gets better. And that's really what differentiates it from a traditional car, where as soon as you drive off the parking lot, it's an old car. But here, my car is the same, even though I've owned it for a year, it's actually better than the car I had last year. And that's really the difference. That sounds a lot uh, uh, very counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's why Tesla, uh, uh, that, that's why we, we got the car because it, they keep innovating and then they, they don't leave you behind. They give you hardware updates and software updates and so on and so forth. That's, that's really the ecosystem we bought into. Which car were you, were, were you driving before the Tesla? Uh, I was driving a, a, a Prius, a, a Toyota yes. Prius. Okay, it's so a hybrid. hybrid. So, so how do you compare the, the Tesla the Prius? I think the technology has come a, a big way. The Prius uh, uh, had a much smaller battery pack. It, it drove almost like your golf car for the most part, right? Low power engine. So they, they did, did the you just say a golf cart? Golf cart, yeah, because it was supposed to be a lower power engine okay. to account for better mileage. But the Tesla has gone the other way, right? Have they have the most else. powerful engine. Yeah, and it's completely battery drawn, right? So. Uh, Gad, uh, at least in the interest of time, I know I have to run. I know we, we started like an hour I, 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 I was supposed to say that. Uh, thank yeah, you yeah. But, for... uh, but absolutely, man. It, it's, it's amazing to talk to you, to share the thoughts. And, and uh, I, I can't wait to see the amount of innovation that is happening. And, and looks like you guys are on the forefront of it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sure that we'll, we'll be able to do this. I'm going to do this again. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Thanks. Take Amazing. care. Say bye-bye. Bye. Okay.